Lord, we have just sung two magnificent songs extolling your love. Your love for sinners. Your love for us. And we will spend the next hour looking at the beastly reality of rebellious humanity. And to think that you would have plucked us up out of the vast sea of humanity, congealed together in warlike contempt for you. By nature, we were your enemies. We were dead in our transgressions and sins in which we walked. We ran, we railed against you, God most high. And that you would love such as us is simply staggering. We pray to be humbled all over again by your great plans for the universe that include your coming to earth, feeble, frail, humble, infinitely powerful, to die as a substitute and conquer death in our place. We long for the day when you will set all things right, when you will indeed reign on the earth, when you will end death itself. In the meantime, Lord, let us fear you and tremble not before men. We ask that you would use this text before us this evening to that end. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Turn in your Bibles to Daniel chapter 7. This is one of the most important chapters in all of the Bible. It marks the turning point in human history. It marks the terminus of human history. It details for us the great swath known as the times of the Gentiles. And it culminates in the glorious return of Messiah, the Lord Jesus, to the earth to reign. This evening, we look at the first portion of it, and we are looking at Daniel's four-beast vision And we're going to jump right in and read this text together, Daniel 7 and the first eight verses. In the first year of Belshazzar, king of Babylon, Daniel saw a dream and visions in his mind as he lay on his bed. Then he wrote the dream down and related the following summary of it. Daniel said, I was looking in my vision by night and behold, the four winds of heaven were stirring up the great sea. And four great beasts were coming up from the sea, different from one another. The first was like a lion and had the wings of an eagle. I kept looking until its wings were plucked, and it was lifted up from the ground and made to stand on two feet like a man. A human mind also was given to it. And behold, another beast, a second one resembling a bear, and it was raised up on one side. And three ribs were in its mouth between its teeth. And thus they said to it, Arise, devour much meat. After this, I kept looking, and behold, another one, like a leopard, which had on its back four wings of a bird. The beast also had four heads, and dominion was given to it. After this, I kept looking in the night visions, and behold, a fourth beast, dreadful and terrifying and extremely strong, and it had large iron teeth. It devoured and crushed and trampled down the remainder with its feet. And it was different from all the beasts that were before it. And it had ten horns. While I was contemplating the horns, behold, another horn, a little one, came up among them. And three of the first horns were pulled out by the roots before it. And behold, this horn possessed eyes like the eyes of a man and a mouth uttering great boasts. Daniel received this four-beast vision, our text tells us, in the first year of Belshazzar. Belshazzar was the last king of Babylon. Most likely, the first year of Belshazzar was the third year of Nabonidus. You remember that Nabonidus became king in 556 BC? You do remember that. I know you've taken notes in our series. His son, Belshazzar, became co-regent and king over Babylon in 553. You'll remember that Nabonidus was the king, but he did not hold to the religious scruples of the Babylonian priests, and so he actually left for another city and left his son in charge of Babylon. That is our Belshazzar, with which we are familiar. At this time, in 553, Nebuchadnezzar has been dead nine years. Daniel is 67 years old, and this is 14 years before the writing on the wall, the death of Belshazzar, and the end of the Babylonian Empire. 
And we discover here that Daniel saw a dream and visions. This dream and these visions were given by God. This was miraculous. These were not the wanderings of Daniel's mind. This was supernatural revelation given by God for the benefit of his people. And Daniel says he wrote it down and related the summary of it. Literally, he says, I related the chief parts, not all of the details. In verse 2, we have this exclamation, behold, and we're going to see this behold five times in this text, in these eight verses, and each time this word behold should startle us because Daniel was startled when he said it. So I'll try to say it loud with an exclamation point. Behold, did I get you? No, I'll try it louder next time. Four winds stirring up the great sea. In the Old Testament, the phrase great sea is used a couple of times for the Mediterranean Sea. That would be the most logical geographical counterpart to this phrase. We see that in the book of Joshua three times. But more often in Scripture, the sea is a reference to humanity, a sea of humanity. And it is used in this way in a number of passages. And a significant clue in our own context here in Daniel chapter 7 comes down in verse 17. We find out in the vision we're looking at this evening that these four beasts come up out of the sea. We find out in verse 17, these great beasts, which are four in number, are four kings who arise from the earth. So the sea is the earth. What, what do we mean by that? Um, their use of the word sea in Old Testament literature and then in the book of Revelation again and again is a picture of the tumultuous mass of the sea of humanity uh, in its opposition to God. Listen to Isaiah 17. Alas, the uproar of many peoples who roar like the roaring of the seas and the rumbling of nations who rush on like the rumbling of mighty waters. Listen to Isaiah 57, 20. The wicked are like the tossing sea. It cannot be quiet. Its waters toss up refuse and mud. Jeremiah 46 compares Egypt to the river Nile and the waters that surge about. In Revelation 13, 1. The dragon stood on the sand of the seashore. A beast came up out of the sea having ten horns and seven heads. On his horns were seven diadems. On his heads were blasphemous names. Revelation 13, 11, I saw another beast coming up out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb, and he spoke as a dragon. Again, sea and earth in Revelation, just like Daniel, used interchangeably for the population of mankind. Revelation 17, 1, one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls came and spoke with me, saying, come here, I will show you the judgment of the great harlot who sits on many waters. And then in the same chapter, Revelation 17, 15, the waters which you saw where the harlot sits are peoples and multitudes and nations and tongues. And this is a feature of prophetic literature in the Bible. A symbol is often given, and you'll see words like like and as over and over again in our text in Daniel 7, and then an explanation of what the symbol is. Thankfully, we have these clues here about what this sea is. It is the sea of humanity, polluted, turbulent, tumultuous, tempestuous, a seething froth of unrest and rebellious chaos. A driver has called it the agitated world of nations. And the four winds, reference to the cardinal directions, north, south, east, and west, indicate the various circumstances swirling about, agitating and stirring up world conflict, changing borders, crumbling empires, and revolutions. In other words, the sovereign hand of God superintending all the activities of his rebellious creatures. And the four winds stirred up the sea. In verse 3, four great beasts were coming up from the sea. That is, these beasts emerge from the population of sinful humanity on the earth. And they are said in verse 3 to be different from one another. And we're going to let the cat out of the bag here. Actually, we're going to let out two cats, a deformed bear, and a monster so terrifying that a comparison to the animal world is not possible. We're going to let them all out of the bag. These beasts are human governments. They are kingdoms and empires that dominate the scenes of world history. And these beasts are different from each other, even as the empires described are different, each from the other. 
And this, of course, reminds us of the vision we've already seen in Daniel chapter 2, Nebuchadnezzar's vision of that great statue. Do you remember it? Those were a depiction of four kingdoms, Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, and Rome, in successive orders, top to bottom, in chronological order of gold and silver and bronze, and then iron, and then phase two of the bottom section, iron and clay. And we have these same four kingdoms depicted here, although with different imagery. And it's helpful to contrast these two visions, Daniel chapter 2, Nebuchadnezzar's vision, and Daniel chapter 7, the visions God gave to Daniel. In chapter 2, we have the great statue of what? A man, dazzling in the sunlight, inanimate, made of precious metals. In fact, Nebuchadnezzar was so impressed with it, when he woke up from his dream, he made one for himself and commanded everybody to worship it. In chapter 7, no dazzling, beautiful, adorable statue. We have instead scary beasts devouring, not inanimate, very animated, animal-like, monstrous, ravenous, brutal, terrifying, and consuming. In chapter 2, we have man's perspective on human achievement, the glories of empires, the nobility of kings, and the magnificence of mankind. In chapter 7, we have more of God's perspective on human achievement. Rapacity, greed, murder, pride, conquest, devastation. As Dale Ralph Davis says, Daniel chapter 7 incorporates the doctrine of total depravity into our politics. Both of these visions close with the coming of Christ in power to reign on the earth. And what a contrast that will be. Shalom worldwide. The end of all militaries, the end of all wars, the righteous reign of world peace under Messiah. Where are the human governments portrayed as beasts in this chapter? I'll quote one older commentary at length here. What are the attributes of beasts? To keep their own at any cost within their might. To quarrel over what they do not have and what they want. To fly easily into bloodthirsty rage at any affront, any aggression for any coveted object under passion. To take utmost satisfaction in the blood, the agonies, the loss, the death, and the objects of their rage. In a word, to be supreme in rule, possession, in indulgence, insofar as their power can avail. There is a fuller interpretation of this four-beast vision coming later in Daniel. At the end of chapter 7, he will unfold in detail the fourth beast. In chapter 8, he'll back up and talk about beasts 2 and 3. But I won't hesitate to identify them this evening. The, The text itself will show us clearly what these four empires are. And Daniel himself will give us a fuller treatment of the details And the details are striking. We have the advantage of history, of looking back on beasts 1, 2, and 3, and on phase 1 of beast 4, and seeing the manner in which Daniel's visions play out in exquisite detail. And that ought to give us great confidence in the outworking of prophetic detail that is still future to us. If the past prophecies that are now to us history were so exquisitely perfect in the minutest details then we ought to trust the minute details of future prophecies yet to come. As one has said, history pays homage to prophecy. You can spend a lot of time, you can waste a lot of time trying to prove that the Bible is true from archaeology and from history and from various other things. And the more time you spend with the history and the archaeology, the more time you will be away from your Bible and it will actually be counterproductive. But if you soak in the scriptures and you learn God's word, you will undoubtedly find in the pages of history and in the field of archaeology those affirmations that the Bible itself has always been true. History pays homage to prophecy. That's the introduction of the four beast vision. Let's begin in verse 4 with beast number 1. Beast number 1 is a lion with wings. 
And if you were here last week, I hope you got scared of lions. Lions are terrifying beasts. They're not as scary as God, and they're not as powerful as God. And so Daniel was safe. But this lion is even scarier than the ones Daniel sat with. It's big, and it has wings. This is a mighty predator, the king of beasts, noble, majestic, terrifying, and powerful, but with added speed. That is the import of wings here. And the lion depicted, this first beast, is Babylon. It's the kingdom of Babylon. It matches the golden head of the statue in chapter 2. It is the first uh, empire listed in the succession of empires in these visions. And the lion was a significant symbol of the empire of Babylon. The Ishtar Gate, which has been reproduced, reconstructed in the Berlin Museum, has a long parade of bright yellow lions on a brilliant blue background. And lions were everywhere in the ruins of Babylon. Statues of winged lions have been discovered in the very ruins of Babylon City. Examples of them can be found in the British Museum today and in the Louvre in Paris. Babylon was referred to as a lion in the Old Testament in a number of places. Jeremiah 4, 7, a lion has gone up from his thicket, a destroyer of nations has set out. He has gone out from his place to make your land a waste. Jeremiah 50, verse 17, Israel is a scattered flock. The lions have driven them away. The first one who devoured him was the king of Assyria. The last one who has broken his bones is Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon. Both of them called lions. Jeremiah 50, verse 44, Behold, one will come up like a lion from the thicket of the Jordan to perennially watered pasture. In an instant, I will make them run away from it. Whoever is chosen, I will appoint over it. Babylon in the Old Testament prophets is also referred to as an eagle. Lamentations 4, 19, Our pursuers are swifter than the eagles of the sky. Ezekiel 17, 3, Thus says Yahweh God, A great eagle with great wings, long pinions, and a full plumage of many colors came to Lebanon and took away the top of the cedar. That is the destruction of the Assyrian army by the Babylonians. And then Habakkuk 1, 8, Their horses swifter than leopards, keener than wolves in the evening. Their horsemen come galloping, their horsemen come from afar. They fly like an eagle, swooping down to devour and interestingly, in Jeremiah 49, 19 to 22, Babylon is called both a lion and an eagle. One will come up like a lion from the thickets, verse 19, and then down in verses 21 and 22, like an eagle. Daniel says, I kept looking. And you imagine Daniel in these visions just transfixed, amazed at what he is seeing, terrified by what he is seeing. I kept looking until its wings were plucked, verse 4. And it was lifted up from the ground and made to stand on two feet like a man. A human mind was also given to it. What is the reference to wings being plucked? I think this is none other than Nebuchadnezzar's pride being plucked. This is a depiction of Nebuchadnezzar's insanity. Nebuchadnezzar was grounded by God, humiliated humbled. You remember that Nebuchadnezzar was Babylon. More than any of the other emperors, more than any of the kings related to the other empires, Nebuchadnezzar was the epitome of what made Babylon Babylon in its resurgence in his day. All his successors were wastes, and they wasted the empire. Nebuchadnezzar was the head of gold, and he was humbled by God, his wings plucked. But notice what is said next. He, he was lifted from the earth. You remember that Nebuchadnezzar was then picked up by God and caused to stand on his feet as a man. That's an indication of his restoration by God. And then finally, the, the mind of a man, literally the heart of a man was given him. That is the return of Nebuchadnezzar's sanity along with some necessary humility and doxology. What was given to Nebuchadnezzar? Some of the best of humanity what a man should be before his God, humble, glorifying God, less beastly. Nebuchadnezzar was turned to a beast, had the heart of a beast, was dumb like a beast, and ate grass like the cattle. And God stood him up on his feet, restored him, gave him reasoning as a man, and made him praise God. 
What's fascinating about this whole text is that God is clearly the kingmaker. Daniel 1 to 8 is full of passive verbs and causative verbs and twice the verb given. Uh, the, the beast was lifted. Uh, that's a passive verb. That happens throughout. And then made to stand, caused to be standing on his feet. Caused of verbs. They are throughout this text. And a human heart or a human mind was given him. And the verb given in verse 4 and verse 6. All of these things indicate that God is the one doing these things. God causes kings to rise and to fall. God causes empires to come and to go. Sinful humans are, of course, doing these activities in rebellion and pride, but God is working all of these things out in his perfect plan. Nebuchadnezzar himself acknowledges this very thing, Daniel 4.35, Nebuchadnezzar's final doxology. All the inhabitants of the earth are accounted as nothing, but he does according to his will in the host of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth. No one can ward off his hand and no one can say to him, what have you done? Nebuchadnezzar the king knew there was a bigger king, a sovereign one in charge of all things who could not be thwarted. The first beast is Babylon, and of course, uh, Daniel is writing from the waning years of the Babylonian empire as he receives this vision. Some of what he has said here is history from Daniel's perspective. That leads us to beast number two. And this beast is a ravenous, lopsided bear. Look at verse 5. And behold, I got some of you, another beast, a second one, resembling a bear. And it was raised up on one side, and three ribs were in its mouth between its teeth. And thus they said to it, Arise, devour much meat. This beast is bigger than the one before. A male brown bear can weigh nearly 800 pounds. They have been clocked at 34.8 miles per hour. Just by way of comparison, Usain Bolt in the 100 meter is the speediest clocked human at 28 miles an hour. Do you know what that means for Usain Bolt? He gets eaten by a brown bear. Uh, another comparison, I hope this is helpful, the Galapagos tortoise uh, has been clocked at a 0.2 miles per hour, just so we understand the spectrum of velocity of land animals. A male brown bear has powerful jaws and four-inch razor-sharp claws. It has a mouth hinged to fit a whole human head inside, and, and I have read numbers of stories of survivors of brown bear maulings. And a fascinating uh, commonality between all of the stories are those who tell of the awful stench inside a bear's mouth. I don't know if you've been mauled by a bear and had your entire cranium inside of a bear's cavernous jaws as it gnawed and crunched and tore skin and ripped off scalp. I'm getting graphic. I'm so sorry. And these people who are experiencing these horrible things and survive it say, oh, what did this bear eat? Oh, this is awful. This is the worst thing ever. The last grizzly bear in Arizona was killed in 1936. So you don't have to worry. Although at Bear Flat recently, um, you know, campers got mauled by a black bear. But I grew up with brown bears, grizzly bears. In Alaska, I lived my elementary school years up there, and we had rules in our family. Uh, we lived in Eagle River, and it was sort of on the edge of the Chugach Mountains and the wilderness, and so just hiking through trails in our backyard, you, you were in danger of bears. We had household rules. If you, if you weren't carrying a backpack laden down with pots and pans on the outside that would clank against each other, we were compelled by my father to sing over and over and over again the theme song to Gilligan's Island. He told us bears hate that. <laughs> and we just knew we had to make noise. The, the worst thing you could do is startle a bear so that it reacted to you when it was scared. The other worst thing you could do was to get between cubs and a mama. 
And we camped a couple of times at Silver Salmon Creek. Silver Salmon Creek was a place you could only get in by boat or by plane. The airport was the beach. And you could only land at low tide on the hard packed sand. So when the tide came in, you couldn't get out. And we didn't have enough seats in the airplane to get everybody there. So my dad flew me and my mom and my sister in with the guns and dropped us off and then flew out to get other friends. And then we camped for the weekend. We were there to catch silver salmon and the bears were there to catch silver salmon. And the silver salmon we caught and put in the cooler, the bears tore through the coolers at night and ate them all. And at Silver Salmon Creek, you, you don't look for bear prints. You look for a spot where there's not a bear print. It is literally covered. And wildlife photographers go there regularly to look and to film brown bears. My dad gave me good advice. He said, son, you don't have to outrun a brown bear. You just have to run faster than your little sister. I was in the middle of the stream fishing, hip waders on in the middle of the river, and a brown bear came down to the river. And I started backing up, and my dad behind me on the bank says, shh, son, stay right there. I freeze. I'm not worried about fishing anymore, but I trust my dad. <laughs> He's got that 12-gauge sawed-off shotgun with a pistol grip, uh, and it's loaded specifically for brown bear. It's shot. Um, slug, 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 shot. And the idea is scare the bear and then try to take out front legs so it can't run fast. And then your last chance to sh pepper it in the face with, with shot to blind it. And then he had his 44 Magnum on his hip. So I trusted my dad. My dad knows what he's talking about. He tells me to freeze in the river. I'm staying. And the bear stands up and sniffs. I start backing up again. My dad says, son, stay there. So I freeze again. Okay, I trust my dad. And the bear comes down, gets in the water, starts coming toward me. I back up again, and my dad says, son, son, stay there. I got to get this picture. <laughs> he also had his 35 millimeter. <laughs> Click. I have that picture uh, at my house framed. Me and the brown bear. I couldn't help on a honeymoon backpacking trip with Janet into Yosemite National Park. We... There was some commotion on the trail ahead of us, and people said, yeah, there's a black bear on the trail. Janet, stay right there. i got to get this picture. I'm way off the track here. Bears are scary. Bears are really scary. That place we used to camp at Silver Salmon Creek, um, uh, a, a notorious bear mauling story involved two wildlife photographers. One went back to the boat. The other stayed there to get one more picture of Mama Bear and the cubs. Mama Bear went behind the tall grass. The cubs stayed here. Where did Mama Bear go? Triangulated around, the, around his flank. When he realized he was in trouble, drops everything, starts running back to the boat, didn't make it. Bear closed the distance. One swipe, his head flew through the air, and his buddy had to take his headless body home. These are powerful, scary animals, and Daniel's dreaming about them, and you're going to dream about them tonight. <laughs> it's a fitting description of the Medo-Persian Empire. Th this bear is lopsided. One side is higher than the other. The, the Persian side was bigger, more prominent, eventually overwhelmed the Medo-Persian Empire and just became the Persian Empire. It's a fitting description. And, and from Daniel's perspective, this one is prophetic. He is still living in the Babylonian Empire, and he's having very specific descriptions of the empire that comes next. This was bigger than the previous. This was, in fact, the biggest empire the world had ever yet seen. From Egypt and the Aegean Sea all the way over to the Indus River, that's the river that comes out of Tibet down through India and Pakistan. This is a huge swath of territory and varieties of peoples and cultures. And this bear is portrayed in the very act of devouring prey. Notice the verse. Three ribs were in her mouth between her teeth. I mean, this is just gruesome. It's like the bear is sitting there staring at you with ribs hanging out of its mouth between the teeth. It's interesting, the Medo-Persians conquered Lydia in 546 B.C., they annexed Babylon in 539 B.C., and defeated Egypt in 525 B.C. These three ribs are the three major empires that the Persian Empire absorbed and conquered in its heyday. Here they are depicted as bloody trophies of her kills still hanging out of her mouth. There will be more about this beast described in Daniel chapter 8. The Medo-Persian bear 
in chapter 8 is depicted as a ram. And we'll get to that when we get to Daniel 8. That leads us to a third beast. This third beast is a four-winged, four-headed leopard. Look at verse 6. After this, I kept looking, and behold, another one, like a leopard, which had on its back four wings of a bird. The beast also had four heads, and dominion was given to it. After this, I was seeing... And Daniel says again, lo, behold, this is scary, terrifying. Another beast? And this one is like a leopard. Our English word leopard comes from two Greek words, which means lion that is spotted. Spotted lion. This is a big cat. Probably the original owner of the designation leopard seems to have been the cheetah. And whether you're dealing with a cheetah or a leopard, you're dealing with a a nimble, fast cat. You know, the cheetah has been clocked nearly 70 miles an hour. These nimble, big cats are notoriously speedy, agile, powerful, and bloodthirsty. Wild leopards are known to drag carcasses twice their body weight 18 feet up into trees. They typically kill via deft camouflage feline patience, and high-speed blitzkrieg attack on unsuspecting animals, either hanging onto the jugular and biting through it or clamping onto the back of the neck to sever a spinal cord. Have you seen a leopard? The Phoenix Zoo? Some wildlife park, you know, its ears are up, the tail flitting, lazy eyes yawning, lounging on a rock, purring in the sun. You know, it's behind steel bars and you've got ice cream in your hand, maybe a Coke and some popcorn, and you're thinking, look at that cat. It's just waiting around to become a sweater or a handbag or something nice to wear. But could you imagine seeing one of these big cats in the wild when you are dinner? Ears flat mouth agape, saber teeth out, haunches flexing, crouching low in the tall grass, eyes locked on you as prey. This is terrifying. I don't want these dreams. But you've never seen a leopard like this one. This leopard has four wings and four heads. The four wings are an element of speed, and this is speedier than the previous big cat with two wings. And it's got four heads. What is this beast? We will find out much more detail about this beast as Daniel unfolds. But this is a representation of Greece. And particularly in the first phase, the exploits of Alexander the Great. Alexander the Great was a son of King Philip of Macedon, a small kinglet in Greece. Alexander, as a child, was tutored by Aristotle. And when he was young, his father was assassinated. He took the throne at 20 years old. And he began a series of lightning military campaigns and quickly took vast swaths of territory and peoples being confident in his abilities and his rapid victories, he soon went after the Persian Empire itself with a modest army of 30,000 soldiers against the Persian armies of hundreds of thousands of troops. And he won and won and won. Plutarch reports that 10,000 pairs of mules and 5,000 camels were required just to haul away the choice loot from the conquest of the Persian armies. And within 12 short years, 336 to 324 BC, Alexander the Great, you might call him ATG for short, that's kind of fun, conquered all of the known world, all of the nations surrounding the Mediterranean that had any armies. Anybody he could pick a fight with, he beat. He controlled everything from the Mediterranean to India. And it was said that when he fought his last battle, he wept because he could find no other armies to conquer. And he died at 32 years old, trying to rebuild the city of Babylon. Alexander the Great left no heir, 
And so his empire was divided between four generals. Antipater governed Greece and Macedonia. He was followed up by another one named Cassander. Lysicamus uh, governed Thrace and Asia Minor. The Seleucids governed Asia and Palestine. And the Ptolemies governed Egypt and then fought over Palestine. In Daniel chapter 8, we're going to find out more about Alexander the Great, except there, he's not a leopard. He's given another metaphor. He's a goat. So we might just call him Alexander the Goat. He was Alexander the Great, then he's Alexander the Greatest of all time. And Daniel called him Alexander the Goat 215 years before he began his military campaigns. This is a four-winged, four-headed leopard, particularly appropriate metaphor for the young, brilliant military strategist who invented blitzkrieg warfare, who died without an heir, and whose empire was left to four generals after his death. Those are the four heads. It's interesting that this vision of the Grecian Empire comes in two phases. Alexander the Great, that phase, or the post-Alexander phase. And Daniel will give us more details about those phases in Daniel chapter 8 and then in Daniel chapter 11. That leads us to a fourth beast. This one is an incomparable monster. An incomparable monster. Verses 7 and 8. After this, I kept looking in the night visions, and behold, a fourth beast, dreadful and terrifying and extremely strong, and it had large iron teeth. It devoured and crushed and trampled down the remainder with its feet. And it was different from all the beasts that were before it, and it had ten horns. While I was contemplating the horns, behold, another horn, a little one, came up from among them, and three of the first horns were pulled out by the roots before it. And behold, this horn possessed eyes like the eyes of a man and a mouth uttering great boasts. Daniel says, I kept looking. What's coming next? And this is the last, the fourth beast. Dreadful, terrifying, and extremely strong, he says. And no animal is named. You might have been thinking, black rhinoceros. Those are like the most deadly, most territorial, most ferocious land beasts there are. What about a saltwater crocodile? I've seen them eat stuff on YouTube. What about a great white shark? Daniel doesn't say, behold, I was looking in the night visions in a car card on megalodon with iron teeth. No, there is no predator to compare this empire with. It's not given an animal. The large iron teeth here are reminiscent of the iron legs in the chapter 2 statue vision. This beast devours and crushes and, and then tramples down what's left over with its feet. In other words, whatever it can't swallow up and gobble up and consume and, and make a part of itself, it tramples into oblivion. You become a part of this beast or, or you just get crushed. With this remarkable animal... This incomparable monster is an apt depiction of the Roman Empire. And we'll get to more details of the Roman Empire at the end of this chapter. That's coming in a few weeks. This verse tells us it was different from all the beasts that were before it. That is a different level of terror, different level of power, different level of devastation, different level of submission, different level of scope, different level of duration and a different level of arrogance. Notice the last phrase of verse 7, this beast had 10 horns. So if you're a hunter, this is like a, a dream beast, massive antlers, a 10-point rack of power. Horns in the Bible are symbols of power, often symbols of kings and kingdoms that wield power. And here these 10 horns remind us of the 10 toes in the Daniel 2 vision. Remember at the bottom of the statue, you had the clay mixed with iron, and at the bottom level, you had these ten toes. That is, they are contemporaneous toes, not consecutive as you go down the list. Here, these ten horns are contemporaneous with one another on this last beast. We find out later in this chapter, and we'll unfold the details of this last one, and really the most important of the four beasts 
uh, the most important human empire uh, will unfold this in the evenings to come. But we find out later in this chapter that these ten horns are kingdoms. And verse 8 tells us that an eleventh comes up from this empire, violently uproots three of them, convincing the remaining seven to submit, and then rules the whole earth, subdues the entire population of mankind. The rule of this one becomes universal. Now, these ten horns exist simultaneously. They must, if three are to be plucked out and seven are to remain. They, therefore, are not successive rulers of the Roman Empire through church history, although many attempts have been made to identify the ten most likely candidates. But there weren't ten Caesars. It's really hard to make the Caesars fit these ten. They're contemporaneous. No reckoning can legitimately identify only ten, nor the three that are plucked, nor the eleventh that rules them all. All of this indicates a phase two of the revived Roman Empire. Even as we're going to see a, a first and second phase of the Grecian Empire, there will be a first and second phase of the Roman Empire. A second phase of this last beast. A second phase which, from our vantage point, has not yet occurred. It is still future to us. Notice the end of verse 8. Behold, this horn possessed eyes like the eyes of a man and a mouth uttering great boasts. Eyes like a man and an arrogant mouth. Eyes here are a symbol of intelligence. You can find that in Zechariah 3, Zechariah 4, Revelation 4, and Revelation 5. That symbolism is used in the same way. This means this beast is not unintelligent, not like an unintelligent beast that is just ravenous for its next meal. All I can think about now is what I'm going to eat next. That's an animal. No, this beast has the eyes of a man. It is calculating, patient, disciplined, cunning. And this one has a mouth uttering great boasts. We find out later in chapter 7, he makes war against God's people and blasphemy against the Most High God. Listen, a lot of blasphemous things have been said in world history. You may remember the Beatles got in trouble for claiming that they were more popular than Jesus. Lots of terrible things have been said. But what is said by this little horn at the end of human history tops them all. What is done by this last iteration of the final beast will surpass all of them. And it is a dangerous combo to have unusual intelligence and unrestrained arrogance. This horn will have them. It's interesting that two beasts in this vision are said to be like a man. You remember beast number one, the Babylon beast, the Nebuchadnezzar beast, was given the heart of a man. Where did that heart go? Humble before God, doxological, glorifying God, esteeming his sovereignty. The last beast is said to be like a man, but the, the humanity described there is the cunning intelligence above the level of some clumsy, brutish instinct he is this little horn that Daniel will describe more in detail at the end of the book that 2 Thessalonians 2 calls the man of lawlessness and the book of Revelation identifies as the Antichrist. This is our introduction to this most notorious of enemies of God's people. Unless perhaps Isaiah 14 is a sideways reference to him. But these two depictions of a beast that is like a man are, are sort of the best and worst of humanity depicted. He, what humanity should be, humbled before God, acknowledging God's sovereignty, ready to serve him and proclaim his kingship to all the earth. And the worst of what humanity is, what, what all of humanity is without grace, what the whole sea of humanity is without God's kindness and redemption, blasphemous, arrogant, gifted, and headed to destruction. The Roman Empire will show up in two phases like the Grecian Empire before. Only this last empire's two phases, and we can see this from our vantage point, are separated by a mysterious period of time the time between advents of Messiah. 
The time between Messiah's coming to suffer and die in the place of sinners, to redeem people unto God for himself, a people for his own possession, and the time when he will return like lightning across the sky to reign in glory on the earth. That is that mysterious mustard seed period that you heard this morning from Mark 4. John talked about that mystery. There's this mysterious period between beast, phase, beast 4, phase 1, and a revived Roman Empire, which will be mankind's last stand against God. The last human attempt at government on its own. And it will yield to the kingdom of Messiah. We step away from these beastly scenes the next Sunday night, Lord willing, and we get to see the Ancient of Days on his throne ruling and the Son of Man presented before him and given the kingdom that is rightly his. What is the significance of a vision like this for the Jewish exiles in Daniel's day? Well, remember, this was the first year of Belshazzar, the third year of Nabonidus. This was a period of tumultuous upheaval in administrations, assassinations, instability, the, the mighty Babylon with no Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar's successors were poor. They rode on the coattails of the, the fatness of the empire and they lived for themselves. Uh, they didn't conquer and build. They weren't the glorious head of gold. They were living on the coattails. Babylon lacked the leadership that it had had in Nebuchadnezzar. Still had the riches, the might, the beauty, but it was on the downhill slide. Would the exiles be protected there? Could some other nation come and, and displace Babylon and then, and then the hopes of the Jewish exiles be at, uh, in jeopardy? I mean, they were told to go into exile into Babylon and pray for the nation and prosper there and God would prosper them. They would build houses and they would have children. Is all of that in jeopardy? Would they return to their homeland? It would be very tempting to trust in the political situation rather than the promises of God. But listen, this vision is critical. To assure the, the nation of Israel in their Babylonian exile that God has a future for Israel and he will not go back on his word. He had to remind them empires will come and go. God is the kingmaker. God is in charge and he will bring all human empires to a mighty, glorious destruction. The stone that pulverizes the statue and the son of man that comes and destroys the final beast. That's coming. They needed to know that. Paul had to remind Jewish and Gentile Christians of that fact in the first century. Romans 9 to 11 is that reminder. God doesn't go back on his promises. J.C. Ryle had to remind the church of that reality in the 1800s. And think about that. What would it mean to be J.C. Ryle? And you can read his book, uh, Are You Ready for the End of Times? A fantastic book. And he wrote outside of his day. He wrote ahead of his theological era because he believed in the promises of God. Just to do a little math here, the 1800s, and I can't remember the date of Are You Ready for the End of Times? But it, it comes sometime before 1948. It even comes before the Balfour Declaration, an official British Zionistic repatriation of Palestine. But he was confident in God's promises. Contrary to one of my heroes, uh, John Owen wrote in the 1600s, and in his two-volume introduction to his seven-volume verse-by-verse commentary of the book of Hebrews, so the commentary on Hebrews is seven volumes. The first two volumes are introductory material. 150 pages of that introductory material is devoted to one question. If 1,600 years cannot prove to you that God is done with the nation of Israel, I don't know what could. Oh, I love John Owen. But he had disbelieved the promises of God to Israel. J.C. Ryle reminded the church, God's still faithful. And, and 1948 is, is remarkable in this instance, if only in this instance, it demonstrates that the most persecuted ethnic group in world history still exists. They're still a distinct ethnic people. God's word clearly demonstrates that God has made promises to that nation. 
And we maintain our confidence that God will keep those promises. So there's a lesson for Jewish exiles in Babylon during tumultuous political upheavals. And here's the promise. There will be many, many more tumults. That's not what I hope to hear. I wanted to be encouraged. You're telling me politics are going to get worse? Yes, much worse. But they are all under God's sovereign hand. He will bring his Messiah to earth twice. And Messiah will end all merely human government to destroy the beasts, bring in his reign of shalom. His kingdom will never end. You don't know when, but you do know who and you know what. Israel needed to know that. They, they needed to have trust in God's faithfulness and anticipation of the fulfillment of his promises. What significance is there for us today? Five times we heard this. And behold, get scared. Something really scary is in my dream and I have to write it down and tell you about it because God gave it to me. You need to read this. Daniel was startled at the terrible reality of the coming world empires. I mean, look at even in verse 8, while I was contemplating the horns, behold, another horn. I wasn't done being scared about this 10-point beast. And another horn comes up. It's just one blow after another of terrifying, tumultuous overthrows of empires and increasingly terrible human government. The terrifying vision of ravenous beasts is supposed to make us pessimistic about human governments, about political power, human achievement, and so-called progress. We're not headed for a brighter future if we just get the right people in place. One historian famously said, revolutions don't bring about new people. They just bring about different ones. The right man for the job isn't from around here. In Joseph Conrad's Heart of Darkness, the ideal man, the main character, is a guy named Kurtz. And he has gone off into the heart of darkness, into the heart of the Congo in Africa. And darkness is played against light. The bright white light of British Western civilization is cast against the darkness of the savages in Africa. And this brilliant white specimen of, of brilliant, gleaming Western civilization is going to go bring the light of all of that to Africa. And what does Kurtz discover there? What does the narrator who's telling the story about Kurtz discover when he finds him? That Kurtz was every bit the beast that every human is. And the heart of darkness was not about the darkest place in the dark continent on the map. It was about Kurtz's own heart. The best that Western civilization had to offer. The best of humanity with the brightest future and the best giftings and an intended, a, a fiancé that loved him back in England. And the whole world reveled around their hero. He was the worst. Just like all the rest. And his last words, speaking about humanity, speaking about his own humanity. Oh, the horror, the horror. You think about the whole history of humankind, and, and I can't help but remember the, oh, I didn't remember it, I wasn't alive in 1937, but you can watch this on YouTube. It was filmed, news reporter Herbert Morrison reporting live when the Hindenburg docked in its maiden voyage. This hydrogen-filled airship carrying nearly 100 people caught fire. More than 30 people died as they burned and fell from this disaster, and the whole world watched it. You remember what he said? Oh, the humanity. And I like to take that two different ways. Oh the, oh, the greatness of humanity. They, they, they built this airship that could travel across the ocean, forget the tempestuous North Atlantic and getting seasick and hitting icebergs. We're going to cruise over it in the lap of luxury. We can lounge around with a restaurant and couches, and it's just smooth. I mean, airship flying. It's incredible. It's like a cruise ship in the air. 
The pinnacle of human achievement and technology, smooth air transit across the ocean, came to a spectacularly disastrous end. And oh, the humanity, as he's weeping, reporting the scene, just becomes this cry of, oh, can you believe what has happened to man? That really is the tragedy of the human story. All the gifting, all the squandered resources of capacity and ability and talent and gifts spent on rebellion against man's maker. When man could be gloriously revealed as the sub-regent of God in his universe, doing God's bidding for God's glory and living up to every purpose for which he was created, man goes down in flames. That is human history. And we just have to have a pessimistic view of it because we get a realistic view of our own hearts. The horror. The horror. So we look forward. We pray for his kingdom to come. We long for his appearing. Some trust in princes. We will trust in the name of the Lord our God. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for this terrifying vision from Daniel. Thank you that you not only gave it to your prophet, but you had him record it for our benefit, for the benefit of Jewish exiles in Babylon for us. May our trust be implicitly in you. Even as we heard this morning, Lord, we could never bring about your kingdom. We could never overtake these awful, terrible beasts that are the mass of humanity aligned against your purposes. But you can, and you will, and you promise to do so. And we pray your kingdom come.